Hi, hello, and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Justin Ruff Marsh, who is just up the road in LA from me here in San Diego. How are you doing, Justin? Yeah, good. How are you? Good, very good. Thank you. And Justin is a sales management radical. You always like to have radicals on the show. So, um, so uh, he wrote this book, The Time Machine, A Radical Approach to the Design of the Sales Function, and argues that uh, the, the assumptions that underpin the traditional approach to sales management uh, <clears throat> are, 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 not, uh, are not correct, right? You know, you, so you take issue with those underlying assumptions, and uh, you don't think that it should be an autonomous mode of, of uh, operation, this sort of art versus science, like give them enough rope, let them do what they want kind of thing. But the fact is that it should be a machine featuring a division of labor, the centralization of everything other than critical field visits. So, so tell me, um, just a number one, like what prompted you to write the book, uh, The Machine? And second off, why do you think it is within the workforce where, where, where well-defined process and division of labor seems to be generally accepted in so many areas that in sales, it still seems to, there still seems to be a conflict or an argument there? So I, I wrote the book because I'd had an experience with with an organization that I was running, uh, but a but a small shareholder in prior to starting um, Ballistics, and we had st- myself and my other partner, who was the major shareholder in the business, had started the business uh, with an intention of a, of sort of recruiting a, 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 a standard commission sales team and and. And uh, approaching sales the way that we had previously, which was in the insurance industry. And what we quickly mm-hmm. discovered was that um, the economics of this new business, which was another type of business in financial services, just didn't support um, the, the traditional commission sales model. So over a number of years, uh, we ran a number of experiments to try and figure out how to fix the economics. And uh, initially, what we tried to do was to increase the productivity of salespeople by taking activities away from them. So mm-hmm. if they didn't have to quote, if they didn't have to prospect, perhaps. Um, and, and by freeing up salespeople's time and, and by hosing them with sales opportunities, we only ever generated sort of incremental improvements in sales performance. Right. And it wasn't until we, uh, out of uh, desperation almost, decided to take away salespeople's autonomy have them sit in a room and feed them prospects one after the other and insist that they, that they, um, that they sold a reasonable percentage of them and cycle out the salespeople who didn't. It wasn't until we took that radical last step, you know, take away their autonomy, take away commissions, pay them a decent income and, and, uh, and make it clear that performance was mandatory, not optional. It wasn't until we took that radical step that we really got some serious uplift. And uh, really I've spent the last 25 years uh, 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 figuring out how to apply that same insult, to, uh, insult, insight, <laughs> insult for some to, to other people. Yeah, I was going to say, there's probably some sales people go, oh, insulting, taking away our autonomy. Um, so how did you, when you first went to implement this, I mean, it is quite a radical step. I mean, if you were taking away commission and you were telling them, this is how you have to operate and you got to follow this rules and all of that. And did, did it, was it hard to attract um, salespeople to that model uh, initially, and then after a while, what type of salespeople really excelled in that environment, and what kind you know cycled out pretty quick? So, so it's 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 harder to sell this. Uh, so this is a tricky question. Mm-hmm. It's hard to sell the idea to salespeople, but it's very easy to sell the proposition in practice. So right. if you say to salespeople, look, what do you like? The, what do you think about the idea of us taking away your autonomy and taking away your commissions? <laughs> then they would be very hostile towards mm-hmm. the idea. They are very hostile towards the idea. But if we say to them, look, we propose to put you in an environment where uh, everything is done for you. The only thing that you have to, the only activity that you're going to be responsible for is uh, is selling conversations. So you don't do any expense reports, you don't do any prospecting, you, you don't do any solution design or proposal generation. Uh, you don't do anything other than have selling conversations. And uh, we have someone manage your calendar for you and uh, uh, we pay you your market value, which is potentially more than, you av- more than your average uh, income currently. 
then in practice, salespeople are, you know, don't have a problem at all with, with the idea, even though they, fi- they perhaps find it objectionable ide- ideologically. <laughs> and and, fi- and re- attracting new salespeople is easy. You know, when we run ads for sales, well, it's certainly easier than in, mm. in, than in the standard model because when we run ads for salespeople, we, 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 we promote, you know, the, the pay band that we're going to pay them in. Um, and we tell them there's no travel involved in most cases because most of our sales teams are inside, not outside. Right. And, uh, we tell them that, um, all sales opportunities are provided for them. No expense reports, no proposals. They can, they can dedicate a hundred percent of their time to selling. And if someone's a true salesperson, uh, th- that's how they would rather operate. But the other interesting thing about this is that we end up discovering that the types of sales environments that we build make it a lot easier for technical folks and, and other fo- folks in other places in the organization to move into sales mm-hmm. because there are a lot of folks who would enjoy being in sales if it weren't for the idea of, of being paid commission and being forced to prospect. You know, right. they're the two things that drive away. And, and oftentimes we find that the best salespeople when we go into an organization are not the best communicators. They're the most persistent and belligerent. Uh, oftentimes not the folks who customers would not, would most like to purchase from. Right. So our, our experience is it's easy to find salespeople and we, rec- we can recruit salespeople who produce better results mm-hmm. th- th- and so th- why, than you why, can in the standard model. Yeah. So why would you argue then that uh, things like, you know, bonuses or commissions or incentives or whatever are not, uh, because most people, you know, most people running sales organizations would say, you know, incent for, for greater performance, like you don't, you have commissions with no cap, so people can earn as much as they want and they push themselves forward. Why, what, what is it, why would you argue against that idea of what you call, I think in your book, the artificial management stimulants? Yeah, so there's two reasons to argue against the idea. Mm-hmm. The first is the philosophical or the academic reason. And that is, it, that is it's well understood in, in academic circles. And, and uh, Daniel, uh, whatever his name is, Daniel Pink made, uh, promoted this idea very recently when he wrote that book, Drive. So it's well understood in academic circles that the extrinsic uh, rewards do not increase performance in knowledge work environments. Um, and, and, and the... The, the jury's well and truly in on that. There've, there's been study after study r- reported by n- numerous people that, that, that show that. Um, so that's the academic argument. And it's fun to debate that over a glass of brandy in the evening. Mm-hmm. But, but the reason why we eliminate commissions is because of the practical argument. And, and, and it's for exactly the same reason piece rate pay was abandoned 50 plus years ago in manufacturing environments. And that's that if you want to... Uh, apply division of labor to sales and have salespeople responsible for just one small, albeit important activity within the sales function, meaning that most of the activities that need to be performed in order to win deals are performed by other people, then it's no longer practical to pay folks on a piece rate. It mm-hmm. causes the environment very quickly to become chaotic. Right. So then, so, how so, you- so the, the, the key point here it's not that we don't want to, we don't, but that's not the point. Mm-hmm. The, the key point is we don't because you can't, mm-hmm. you simply can't. If you have salespeople in a position people where they're involved. performing a single activity, and let's say there are 15 activities uh, spread across the generation of sales opportunities, the design of solutions, the generation of documents, et cetera, legals, et cetera, et cetera. If you have, you know, let's say 15 activities and only one of them is being performed by a salesperson and you pay the salesperson on a piece rate, you're, you're going to have a mutiny on your hands. Sure. And at, at worst and at best, a, an extremely dysfunctional environment. So when you go, when you work with other organizations and you go into transition them from a, an older model into your model, I mean, what are the steps involved in that? Because that sounds like, I mean, that's, that's a pretty radical departure, right? So I think that um, most of the times if we go into an organization, it's because the, the senior executive or sometimes members of the board have read the book. Mm-hmm. And, it addre- and the book offers a solution to a problem. And the problem is, and we see this in numerous organizations, that, that the standard approach to sales growth has hit diminishing returns. 
In other words, the organization could just can't grow sustainably by adding more salespeople, which means mm -hmm. they either have to stop growing or they have to grow exclusively by acquisition. Um, so most of our clients are faced with the alternative of either not growing at all, growing by acquisition or implementing our model. So right. it's important to understand when folks come to us, it's, that's generally the situation they're in. You know, we don't have folks coming to us saying, look, we read the book. It's, it's kind of exciting. We think we're going to do it on a whim. You know, the, the organizations we work to have to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. terms of how do we do it, um, interestingly, most of the work that we do is, is, is done on functions that are adjacent to sales. We don't touch right. sales much. So if, if we were to spend two years working with an organization, most of those two years would be spent working on customer service, on engineering, and on the marketing department. And only a very small number of months would actually be spent on sales. So what is it that you have to do um, with the adjacent departments? Because obviously, if you're dividing up all of these tasks and that, and you're having a more um, distributed model here, there's new things that they need to do or things that they need to do better. So what are some of the things that you work on with customer service and marketing? It's my mom. I told her that we, I was. Yeah, it <laughs> could be my mother too. Yeah. Um, anyway, so what what are some of the things that you have to do with marketing and customer service in order to get them um, aligned to this process? So, well, let, let's take the the three common adjacent functions we work on in turn. The first is customer service. So, mm -hmm. um, we want to take away from salespeople all what we call yours to lose business, and this is business that's essentially repeat business for the most part, right. you know, where momentum is acting in our client's favor. We don't want salespeople involved in transactions. If those transactions essentially consist of a, of a, you know, a prospect walking towards them with a hundred dollar bill, you know, so that means we need to design the customer service team so that mm -hmm. it uh, can be completely self-sufficient when it comes to all order processing, quote generation and is issue resolution associated with day-to-day -day repeat transactions which of course is probably in most cases, 70 plus percent of an organization's revenue. So the customer service team needs to be completely self-sufficient when it comes to processing at least 70% of the organization's revenue in most right. organizations. And that requires a big uplift in terms of capacity and capability and, and a significant improvement in a whole bunch of processes within customer service. Um, um, the next department would be engineering. And in a, in a technical environment, uh, we don't want salespeople involved in the design of solutions or in the generation of documentation. So that means we need to re-engineer the engineering department so that it can take responsibility for all solution design and document generation. And in many cases, that means splitting up the engineering department. If, if there's just one big huddle of people, we need to split engineering into at least two groups. We need you know design engineering, which is sales focused and production engineering, which is production focused. Um, and then where marketing is concerned, you know, most marketing departments only generate a tiny percentage of the sales opportunities that salespeople are, prospect, are prosecuting. But in our world, so the marketing department has to generate 100% of them. Right. So that means that we need to teach marketing to generate opportunities at scale, which they generally not only have no idea how to do, but if you ask them how to do it, they will tell you precisely the wrong way to go about doing it. Marketing departments are obsessed with inbound and content marketing and mm -hmm. you simply and except in unusual cases you simply cannot generate opportunities at the necessary scale to drive the kind of growth that our clients are looking for with inbound so we we need to uh we we need to first address that sort of philosophical problem we need to get them off the inbound band, bandwagon yeah. you know i mean there's nothing wrong with inbound it's just you know uh, a a uh, a well, I always have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a, always have a problem when it's all or nothing. It's like everybody exactly. runs over to inbound and away from other things, and then over time, people realize that oh, well, inbound isn't delivering everything we were promised. So now we better sort of dust. It off doesn't, and in most organizations, it simply can't. Which means we either need to scale down our growth plans, which oftentimes mean that our competitors grow faster than us, which is kind of idiotic or we just uh, um, ease up on the sort of the ide ideology and recognize that most organizations have to do a mix. Um, 
So the, the, first we fight that battle and then where marketing is concerned, we have to build generally a small team within the marketing department that is specifically resourced to generate salespeople's sales opportunities for them. So if you consider those three functions and the volume of work that has to mm -hmm. be performed in a reasonable size business, say a, you know, a $50 million business, we, we might spend right. a year and a half to two years all together working with that organization. And probably a good 18 months of that would be spent uh, working on, working on those other departments. And then just one last question before we run out of time is then obviously another big change is how this is all managed, right? So there obviously has to be some transition in the management approach to sales. Yes. So most sales functions aren't managed at all in an, in an intelligent, if we use it, if we sort of adopt an intelligent definition of the word management and the reason they're not makes good sense, of course. And that's because if salespeople are, are, are autonomous, as we encourage them to be, then they don't need management uh, because the definition of autonomous is they march to the beat of their own drum. Mm -hmm. So um, m most organizations simply do not have line management in sales. Uh, um, now, if we take away salespeople's autonomy, we absolutely have to have line management. So uh, we we build line management into our organizations. So we manage sales functions just like a, you know, a, a, a smart manufacturer would manage the shop right. floor, actively manage it. What salespeople might otherwise call micromanagement. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but what it is, obviously it's very focused because they have to manage, um, you know, various activities as opposed to you see a lot of sales management where it's really, you know, they spend their whole time like trying to, you know, close business on behalf of their salespeople or, you know, they end up acting like a super salesperson. Yeah. They end up being expensive individual contributors, expensive yeah. and relatively unproductive individual contributors. <laughs> and unhappy too, largely because they went from uh, being, you know, often being the best, uh, yep. you know, salesperson to being a mediocre at best sales manager. Yeah. Um, well, that's uh, fascinating. So the book is the machine: a radical approach to uh, a radical approach to the design <clears throat> uh, of the sales function. Um, before you go, uh, Justin, if you want to tell people a little bit more about your organization and what you do. So the organization is called Ballistics. Uh, we build sales functions for organizations. I, uh, rather than promoting the organization, I, mm -hmm. I, it would probably makes more sense to promote the book. I think if folks are interested in this discussion they should go and buy the machine. It's available pretty much only from Amazon, I think. Right. Um, and uh, I, I think, you, you know, if you read the book and, and your conclusion is, oh my God, this, the, the, you know, this, the, this, is, this is the medicine that we need to, uh, well, these are the ideas that we need to grow our organization faster, then, you know, folks can, can take a look at our website and so, certainly we, we're there to help. But, you know, the, the most important thing is to, is to absorb the ideas and see if you think that A, the ideas make sense and B, if you think that they make sense for your organization at this particular point in time. Fantastic. And uh, we'll have links to the book and everything in the, in the profile. So it's easy to find. So Justin Rothmarsh, thank you very much for joining us today. Love the, uh, love the ideas that you put forward. I think that there is uh, I think you know there's a lot written about sales, but very, very f little of it is radical new departures or radical new ways of doing things. It always seems to be a new flavor of what's there already. So I really commend you on your work, uh, and I really would encourage people to take a look at it. Thank you, John. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM, CEO from the expert interview really soon. Thank you.